Hey everyone, welcome to Zero Labs. Today is Saturday, March 25th, 2017. I'm Mark Bratch, your host, and as you can see beside me, the glove box is almost complete. Um, all that's left really is to glue the, the top around the seams and cut out the access port on the top. I may also add a second access port on the side for a cylindrical uh, sample entry where I can actually take it down with a vacuum and flood it with argon on, uh, on smaller, smaller batches so that uh, I can introduce new samples to the glove box without having to completely uh, purge all of the argon out of the box and uh, start over again and, and waste a whole lot of argon which is uh, not that cheap. So this is going to be more of a, uh, a how-to video, how I went about constructing my, my glove box. This is by no means the uh, definitive guide to making a glove box, but it's, it's one, one way and I want to present it to you now. So as I said, all that's really left now is to glue the top on. As you can see, the rest of the box holds, holds itself together pretty well. And all I've done is uh, temporarily tape the seams around the edges and then run my bead of goop adhesive, the famous goop, goop adhesive. <laughs> that I, it's my uh, my go-to adhesive, very elasticized, rubberized type of adhesive uh, to uh, seal the corners. It's kind of like a, an aquarium tank. And then I also have these 26-inch long gauntlets. Uh, these are rubberized gloves that are sold for the purpose of trapping uh, beaver, muskrat, water waterfowl, and and the like. Uh, for hunting. You normally pay mm, about $35 for a pair of these. I found a set on eBay for $18. These things are awesome and they are the exact right size. They're insulated, full length, and the, the opening at the top is just the right size for the opening on the port entry for the glove box. So let's put it together. first step in the process of course is to decide how big is your box going to be and then you need to calculate uh, the, the size of the pieces that you want to cut from the from the master sheet of plexiglass that you have on hand fortunately I was able to salvage a couple of full four by eight foot sheets of plexiglass from a studio remodel at our television studio that uh, was being thrown away so uh, I got quite quite a bit of plexiglass to work with which was kind of nice so you can see from this diagram that I've laid out my pieces in such a way as to minimize the amount of waste the total amount of plexiglass that I ended up using for this project is the four foot wide width of the of the of the raw piece and 36 inches so the the the, uh, the piece that I cut out of the, the 4x8 sheet is 4 feet by 3 feet. Next we actually need to cut the pieces. To do this I purchased some specialty purpose blades exactly for the job as suggested to me by one of my nerd herd and uh, these blades worked out remarkably well. Uh, these were purchased at Home Depot for I think about six dollars for the for the set of three and in this close-up picture you can see that the blade very very closely resembles another blade that I that I recognized right away and uh, that the lower blade is the saw blade of my Swiss Army knife the uh, the way the grooves are cut through it, it was just amazing how how well it cut 
Now because the, the sheet was so large, I couldn't work with it on my bench. I actually had to lay it on the floor. But in order to give my jigsaw clearance uh, away from the floor, I had to put some 2x4s on edge underneath the 4x8 sheet of plexiglass in order to make the cut. This picture here shows the result of my first cut uh, with just one 2x4 and the plexiglass sheet sort of draped over it because it just made a, um, a bulge in the middle where I, next to the line where I made my cut. And as I made my cut across the sheet of plexiglass, you'll see that the bend got tighter and tighter because the amount of plexiglass was thinner and thinner as I was cutting through the piece. And as, it, as the bend got tighter and tighter, you started to create these stress fractures that you see in the edge. Fortunately, this was on a waste piece of plexiglass, so I was able to cut that out and not use it. Here I'm using the coffee can to draw the, uh, to draw the circles on the front panel where I'll be cutting the openings for the, uh, the coffee can when I cut it in half to create the, uh, the entry ports. The best way to make the starter holes in the front panel for the uh, circular ports is to use this stepped drill bit. In fact, uh, using a stepped drill bit is the best type of drill to use for any type of uh, hole drilling in plexiglass. It makes a very clean hole so that you can insert the blade for the jigsaw and then start and finish your cut in that, at the edge of that hole that you've drilled in the, uh, in the plexiglass. Next, I cut the holes for the port entries. Uh, to do that, I've attached my uh, w little portable wet dry vac, and the, uh, the wet dry vac attaches to the saber saw uh, blowing out rather than sucking in. I found that sucking in did not retrieve the large chips of plexiglass that, that came off the blade, and blowing out against the blade also helps to keep the blade cool when you're making the cuts going around the uh, around the circle. The blade also tends to get hotter when you're trying to make a corner because the friction of the blade against the side of the opening uh, as you're going around. A straight cut normally creates a channel that's just a little bit wider than the blade so you don't get as much friction. To split the coffee can in two sections, I'm using a cutting wheel in my angle grinder uh, and support it in the bench almost wide open so that it doesn't roll around as I'm making the cut. Once the, uh, once the cut is complete and I have the two pieces, I simply trim, them, uh, trim the edges to get rid of all of the sharp burrs. Uh, I tried using tin snips, but I found that it's just, just easier to use a, a pair of uh, regular scissors because the, the gauge of the metal is so thin that it just cuts like butter with the scissors and pr produces a very, very clean edge. Next I cut three quarter inch wide tabs in the sharp edge of the two ports and uh, bend them over so that I can insert them through the port openings that I cut in the front plate and it rests nicely and gives me uh, something to secure to the back side of the, of the front plate. Then I tape the tabs to the back side of the panel using this aluminum tape. I um, actually overdid it because in the end I ended up taking the aluminum tape off again and just smearing more of the uh, adhesive, sealant, adhesive sealant all the way around the edge where the tabs are on the, on the back as well as the corner at the front. In this picture here you can see how I've test fit all of my pieces together simply by assembling them at the corners with some two inch wide masking tape and then I've uh, sanded the edges and just got everything perfect before I, before I went on to the next step. Here I'm removing one of the protective film layers that is affixed to the, uh, the plexiglass. The, these plexiglass panels had uh, let me see, one, two, three, four layers of protective film. And uh, one of them was smoke colored, the other was clear, and then on the other side uh, there were two clear layers. Um, some of them did not come apart very, very easily, and um, 
left a adhesive residue behind that I first tried to remove with chemical solvent like uh, Goo Gone or Mineral Spirits. That was a bad idea. All it, uh, all it did really was smear it and made it even more difficult. In the end, I ended up using the 2-inch wide masking tape and just sticking it back down to the left, the uh, adhesive that was left behind and using it like, uh, uh, like those strips that uh, women use when they're, when they're waxing, okay? You apply it down and you just tear it off and it just pulls, pulls everything that's underneath with it. You do that a few times to the adhesive against the plexiglass and it comes very, very clean. It really does work very well. And now we're ready to put it all together and glue the inside seams. Uh, I actually ran, ran out of masking tape, so I ended up using duct tape and tearing off little strips of, of the duct tape to put the panels together in this picture, and then uh, put the, the glue, the, uh, the goop adhesive, all the way around the inside edges, just smeared with my, uh, my index fingers to create the seal as well as to bond the corners together. That also worked very, very well. So that's about it for the glove box. Uh, as I stated earlier, all that's left is to cut a rectangular access port on the top, build in a uh, cover or a hinged, a hinged lid for it that is sealed with gasket material that I picked up at Home Depot today. Um, sealed with gasket material on a hinge and it will probably secure with some thumb screws uh, or some, some wing nuts and screws and uh, I will be cutting it out of this leftover piece of plexiglass or Lexan or whatever this material is. It's heavier than plexiglass so I, I, think, it's, I think it's Lexan. But anyway, uh, I'll be cutting a section of this out for access in the top and I'll also be making a removable panel for the back of the glove box so that I can affix different uh, heating coil fixtures to the box and then uh, try, try different arrangements that way too. It'll, it should be a very flexible arrangement. The next phase of course is to uh, integrate the glove box with the induction heater and, and start making some alloy. I'm looking into the pricing of uh, argon tanks and the argon gas not cheap. Uh, hopefully I can get away with uh, the 1500 watts. If not, I'll also have to uh, dig pretty deep for, <laughs> for uh, that, uh, that specialty capacitor that I need for the tank circuit. I hope I don't have to go there. Anyway, I hope you're all enjoying the series. As always, please rate, share, comment, and subscribe to my videos. And peace, everyone.